In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Monday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. Father John Tregilio is in the house. If you've got a question for Father, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's a free phone call anywhere in North America, 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is one 205 2712985 and if you are outside of North America we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1 205 271 2985 you can always send us an email openline at ewtn.com or you can text your question text the letters ewtn to 55000 wait for a response text your first name and your question Message and data rates may apply. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your call screener is Charles Beery, I'm guessing. Uh, and our host is he is every single Monday from the Mount, Mount St. Mary Seminary, Father John Tregilio. How are you? I'm doing well, better than, than last week. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> minus a tooth, but uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> also minus a little bit of pain, huh? Yeah, a little bit. Minus a little. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, Father, a um, couple of things I wanted to touch on here at the beginning of the program. It's the Feast of St. Valentine uh, of Rome, and a lot is not known about him, and there are conflicting stories and various fables and tales of lore that have gone on about him, and he was actually taken off the list in the uh, uh, off of the, the Latin Rite list, uh, you know, some time ago because of the uncertainty surrounding some of the stories that were circulating about him. But one thing that we do know is he was a martyr, and we can certainly celebrate yes. that, huh? Absolutely. And he wasn't, he was taken off the calendar just like St. Christopher, but they didn't throw him out. So I don't want people to think that he got kicked out of heaven or uh, they just don't have a lot of corroborative evidence of the exact time and they can't you know uh, of uh, dates and, and things like that like we do with other contemporary saints but uh you know it, he's still i'm firmly convinced he truly existed and we have people who refer to him it's just that we don't have like saint augustine we certainly no one could question that he walked this earth yeah and we have uh uh if anybody has maybe been to an extraordinary form liturgy in the last couple of weeks um, they will know that uh, Lent is drawing near because we are into the Jaysima Sundays, yep. and uh, and uh, Lent is is just around the corner, just after the turn of the uh, the uh, calendar to March. The first Wednesday in March will be Ash Wednesday this year, and um, what, just talk a little bit from a pastor's standpoint. And then from a professor's standpoint at the seminary, mm. um, some things that people can do to prepare themselves uh, to have a good and holy Lent, and, and how do you instruct uh, the men that are in formation for the priesthood with regard to approaching uh, seasons like the Lenten season? Well, uh, first, as a pastor, I always made sure we had some things available to the parishioners Obviously, we're not presuming or expecting that everybody's going to participate in everything, but obviously you want to have uh, Stations of the Cross made available on, on Fridays. But we need other things during the week, um, whether it's a novena or litanies, uh, other devotions. Uh, you know, Many parishes have um, benediction after the Stations of the Cross. Some have rosary and benediction on a, on a Wednesday, um, different Bible study. But you want to make things available for your parishioners that you typically don't have outside of Lent. And most of all, you want to have uh, time for confessions. And so a lot of parish uh, pastors are having confessions made more frequently. They have uh, penance services where several priests come in and people go individually uh, to confession. Uh, what I ask the seminarians and I would ask my parishioners to do in these weeks coming up just before Lent, 
uh, ask yourself, what do I want to do? Lent is not a spiritual Olympics where you're trying to impress God by the things you can do. Uh, the purpose of Lent, the purpose of mortification is to strengthen you. So if you can say no uh, to your will in little things, then hopefully you can say no to the big temptations. So, you know, giving up, you know, chocolate. A lot of people do that, except when I was in Hershey, because that would cripple people's <laughs> employment. <laughs> but doing th little acts of self-denial that are not, these are not evil things you need to get rid of anyway. But you're, you're cutting back, and you're doing it within moderation. Like St. Therese of Little Flower said, little things done well, done often, and done out of love mean the most to God. So people would come to me and say, Father, I want to go on bread and water. I say, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, you do that. And I said, by the third uh, day or the, th or the second week, I have to come and anoint you in the hospital, especially if this person's diabetic, they're on medication. I said, how about you observe the church's understanding of fasting? One full meal, two little ones that if together don't equal the one full one and no snacking. I said, that would be a lot more productive than you trying to do something like, oh, I'm only going to have bread and water. Because either one, you're not going to do it and you're going to get frustrated, or two, you'll accomplish it and it'll go right to your head and make you filled with, with pride. So you want to do little tiny things, little acts of mortification, as well as some uh, spiritual corporal works of mercy, and intensify your prayer life. Uh, go to daily Mass, or if you can't go there physically, uh, watch it on television, listen to it on the radio. Get to confession. Um, these are little things that make these 40 days special, but you have to plan them now. Don't wait to Ash Wednesday uh, and then say, oh, my goodness, what am I, what am I going to do? And that's a common mistake that I think all of us make, not just in the spiritual life, but in general, is we have a tendency to bite off more than we can chew, huh? It's like people with New Year's resolutions, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. To what end? Okay, yeah, you, you're going to be a, hopefully a better person. But this is not to impress God. Now, if you can, you know, die on the cross and then rise from the dead, that'd be something. But none of us can do that because we're not Jesus Christ. But we can, um, like I said, use some um, moderate, uh, temperate acts of mortification, which, again, it's not meant to punish me. This is not uh, penance and mortification are not punishment, but it's training, physical, spiritual training for the soul and, and especially for the will. And I think that's a point that can't be uh, belabored enough, quite frankly. And St. And Paul talks about this all the time. And we should be mindful that we're not giving something up or we're not undergoing some sort of a penance or a mortification for the sake of, uh, of undergoing a penance or a mortification. But if I can take the... Con you know, St. Paul talks about taking control of the flesh. If I can take control of my flesh in these small matters... When the, when the evil one really comes at me with something that's seriously a jeopardy to my faith, then I'll be in condition to have a better chance of withstanding that temptation. Exactly. And I say to people, you know, like when we were kids, we were always trying to outdo each other. It was like spiritual poker. You know, I raise you by three acts of penance. Um, you know, by, I, my, because my name is Tregilio at the end of the alphabet. So by the time it got to me, I would say to Sister Gertrude in third grade, I don't know what to do, sister. You better think of something because it's, it's coming up soon. Uh, it's that moderation, and like you said, it's training the will to say no. And I tell people, how about abstaining one day a week from social media? Not give it up completely for Lent, especially if you use it uh, to help uh, edify you and, and inspire you what to pray for. But if you, or like a, I said, this one seminarian said, if you drink coffee every day, one day a week, take it with something that you don't normally, if you don't, if you drink it black, then put a little milk in it once or vice versa. If you have it with cream, take it black one day a week. That's not, that's not going to be on your obituary. It's not going to be in your canonization process that you did that. But that little tiny inconvenient uh, act of mortification will help you in the long run. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. We've still got three phone lines open for you at 833-288-3986. If you are outside of the United States and Canada, we'd still love to take your phone call today on Open Line Monday. That number is 1-205-271-1111. And we'll even put you... Straight to the front of the line if you are outside of North America at 
888-382-2985. You can always send us an email. That address is openline at ewtn.com. That's openline at ewtn.com. And put Monday or Father John in the subject line. We'll get it to the appropriate location. Uh, And you can even text your question. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response. Text your first name and your question. Message and data rates may apply. It's EWTN's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. Are you ready to spread your wings? Wings is the weekly newsletter that's packed with exclusive news, program information, features, and updates of all that's going on at the Global Catholic Network. To sign up, go to EWTN.com, click subscribe, enter your name and email address, and you'll start getting your wings every week. Get your wings today. It's the weekly newsletter from EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. 60 Seconds with Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. This universe of ours is a free universe. It is a universe of character making, of soul making. Almighty God is placed into our hands. Think of it, the power to make ourselves saints or devils. It is up to us. There are some laws that We cannot disobey, for example, the law of gravitation and certain biological laws like circulation of blood. But in a moral universe, we are free either to obey the laws of God or to disobey them, just as we are perfectly free, for example, to obey the laws of health or to disobey them. The people you know and trust are on EWTN. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. Hey, did you know that EWTN Radio is available on many smart speaker systems like the Amazon Echo and Google Assistant and others? For example, you can listen to EWTN Radio just by saying, Alexa, ask EWTN to play Open Line Monday. Check it out today. Uh, EWTN Radio available on most of your smart speaker systems. If you'd like to be on the program with Father John Tregilio, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. First up today is Paul in Saginaw, Michigan. He's listening on Ave Maria Radio. Paul, thanks for holding. You are on with Father John. Happy St. Valentine's Day to all of you and all of yours, gentlemen, first of all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And... Yeah, and uh, uh, Father, uh, uh, I had heard that uh, uh, at the at the rite of baptism, the sacrament, you know, the priest recites the prayer, uh, "I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit," etc. But I also heard, and I had never known this in my entire life that the priest also recites a sacramental prayer of exorcism. And my question is, why is exorcism called a sacramental? And number two, if that prayer of exorcism is not recited, is that baptism valid? Okay, very good questions. Uh, first, I'll answer the second one because that's easier. Um, if the priest or the deacon, because both are priests of the sacrament of baptism, does not say the, the prayer of exorcism that's in the ritual, it's still valid. Um, it, would, it would be illicit if he omitted things that were normally 
like the uh, anointings that are in there and that, that prayer and the other things. Let's, obviously, if it's in preclo mortis, in danger of death, then all that's needed is the pouring of water over the head and then the, the, the formula, I baptize you in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And again, that's so important that it's I baptize you because Rome had just reiterated uh, those priests or deacons or bishops who said different words where they said, we baptize you, that's invalid. Or I baptize you in the name of the creator, redeemer, sanctifier, that's invalid. The prayer of exorcism is a sacramental, not a sacrament. Uh, it's in the in the um, Roman ritual. It's It's considered something that the church created as opposed to the seven sacraments, which were all instituted by Christ himself. So the, the exorcism prayer that's in there is not the same as the full ritual or rite of exorcism that's uh, done when someone's uh, possessed or obsessed by uh, a demon. This is acknowledgement that when we're born in original sin, we're under the domain of the devil until we're baptized, made a child of God, original sin is washed away, and we have an infusing of sanctifying grace, uh, then we're released from our captivity uh, to the evil one. So the prayer of exorcism is merely an affirmation that until we're baptized, because obviously this prayer is not said after the water's poured, it's said beforehand, just like the oil of catechumen, cumens is used before the actual baptism, and then once the person, the baby or the adult is baptized, uh, then uh, the uh, sacred chrism oil is put uh, on their head. But um, to go back to your original question, um, yes, um, the, um, the exorcism is not an essential part for validity, but it is part of lyseity um, if the priest or deacon is doing this in a normal uh, situation in, in the parish. God bless you, Paul. We appreciate the phone call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Next up is Celine right here in Birmingham, Alabama, listening on Roku. Celine, you're on with Father John. Hello, Father. I have a two-part question about my responsibility towards a new friend. I've known this lady for a few months now, and she's Catholic, but she seems to be proud of saying, but I'm a bad Catholic. Um, and she disagrees with a lot that the church teaches, but uh, at the same time, she loves going to adoration, she loves going to Mass and receiving communion, but she'll receive communion anywhere, like mm. at Church of the Highlands or any place around, and she doesn't see any difference, and she thinks it's mean that the Church doesn't let everybody else receive communion. So I've tried to respond to that using some EWTN <laughs> Uh, apologetics uh, things and so here's the two part thing she she likes to tell me what she doesn't like but she doesn't like receiving <laughs> responses like mm. well the reason the church does yeah. that is X yeah. and she'll she'll just make a face and like well that's not what I was taught you know the nuns she had mean nuns yeah. that story and so that's the first question. Like, how much responsibility do I have to, like, keep pressing it, or do I just try to be friendly? And then the other thing is I brought her to Mass there at EWTN, and that was before I knew that um, she refuses to go to confession, and she just mm -hmm. made a look like, don't even go there. Um, so she admits she's a bad Catholic. She won't go to confession but she loves to receive communion. It mm -hmm. makes me wonder, well, do I not invite her again to Mass? Yeah, those, that, that, I mean, that is, a, a, sad to say, a, a, not an atypical situation. One, when people usually ask or, or express to us their objection to church teaching or church practice, normally speaking, they're not interested in what the church actually says. They're just making a statement. They're into polemics. It's different when someone asks you a question sincerely and says, why does the church do this? I would like to know, with the possibility that maybe they might change their mind. Then you have an obligation to actually, as best you can, explain it to them or refer them to where they could find uh, the answer to that, whether speak to the parish priest or deacon or refer them to a, a book or pamphlet or something like that or go on EWTN. But more often than not, when people make those statements like, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't believe in that confession business. Well, 
you know, they're not really asking you uh, for the church's teaching. Uh, that doesn't mean that you don't make an attempt. But if she keeps on saying she doesn't feel the need to go, um, she's com- you know, if she's in mortal sin and th- hasn't had that sin absolved in the sacrament and she's committing the sin of sacrilege, um, you need to at least explain it to her once. But um, if she's going to be obstinate and, and just not listen, she's trying to justify what she's doing. Deep down, though, I think she knows she's not 100% correct because if she thought she was... There'd be no need for her to uh, explain herself, to rationalize. Um, You're in a situation where uh, it's different than if this were one of your children and you have a moral obligation to remind them because that's part of your familial connection to them. But when you're a sibling, when you're um, a child, uh, a grown-up child, uh, it's a little bit more difficult. Like Jesus said, you know, a prophet's not without honor except we're in his own house, in his own town, and I would say even among your own friends, that doesn't mean you don't make the uh, attempt, but many times people will be more open to an objective uh, third uh, per, third party. Uh, that's where you need to suggest to this your, your friend, maybe you need to talk to the priest or deacon about your issues, your concerns, or just your positions, and that might have more of an effect. I would say keep trying, but you have to do it with charity. Uh, you have to do it uh, consistently, but you don't want to harangue harass and and pester them because then that won't have much of an effect but the same token you don't want to keep quiet and say nothing so yes i would continue to invite her to mass but keep reminding her that you know um you know because i've been at the ewtn to celebrate mass when father briganti i would come down to tape our web of faith and many times they would ask us could you hear confessions right after mass or anytime i go down to visit on my own um you know they make it available and you go up to the shrine in hansville <laughs> the priest is in the box, I and mean, many there's more than one confessional up there. Uh, Lent's coming up. There's going to be many opportunities for people to go to confession. So, you want to do this in a again a charitable way, but also uh, with uh, kindness. God bless you, Celine. Uh, Celine, thanks for the phone call today. That opens up a line for you at eight three three two eight eight. E-W-T-N, that's the number Tom used, a first-time caller in Lapeer, Michigan, listening on Ave Maria Radio. Tom, you're on with Father John Tregilio. Hey, Father John, how's it going? Fine. Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, my question is, it's kind of a weird one, but I've been given two very unsatisfying answers. Uh, okay. Regarding, fa- <laughs> ca- regarding fasting the Catholic way. Okay. Yes. I'm an engineer. I work uh, work from home telework, but quite often my eating patterns, I kind of graze throughout the day. So when I approach the Catholic position, you know, the one mm-hmm. small meal or one regular meal and the two partial meals, yes. my question is, suppose my morning meal is just a small cup or half a cup of oatmeal. Yeah. Is there a time limit to where I have to consume that all before it becomes a snack like it's 10 minutes fine but 11 minutes isn't because the way i tend to eat i take a bite i check my email a half hour goes by and i'm like oh shoot do i have to scrap the rest of this or same thing with like a half (laughs) half of a peanut butter sandwich or grilled cheese sandwich am i allowed to cut it into slivers (laughs) and sprinkle it throughout the day and the two answers i've been given is one that's not fasting and the other one is, yeah, you're being too legalistic. You know, put your engineering mind aside. <laughs> and here I'm thinking, it is kind of a sacrifice because it's, you know, cutting calories way down. And yet, at some point, is that like trying to mimic the snack pattern with limited food? Yeah. Like- uh, well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because, technically speaking, the obligation uh, to fast uh, for the Catholics is on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday uh, under the new um, 1983 Code of Canon Law. And actually it was amended shortly after the Vatican Council. Uh, Those are the two days that Catholics who are um, between the ages of 18 and 59 are obligated to follow. Now you can voluntarily fast on Fridays in Lent if you want, on Fridays throughout the year, on Wednesdays in Lent, but your obligation is on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. So I think those are two days where, you know, unless for medical reasons, 
like I said before, if someone's diabetic, if they're hypoglycemic, if the doctor says you have to take uh, you know this this medication with food, and he's prescribing it for four or five times a day, you're dispensed. If you're a pregnant woman, if you're nursing, uh, you're a mother who's nursing, you're you're exempt. Um, but if you're normal, healthy. Uh, and like you said, in your, your situation, it's only those two days that you're absolutely obligated. So I would say on those two days, make the, make the effort to, to have one full meal, two small ones. But then during the rest of Lent on Fridays, if you want voluntarily, um, you can fast as you described. You know, your lunch, you're spreading it out. Your, your, your breakfast, you're spreading out. It's the, the quantity that, that you're managing, Okay. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. This is an EWTN bookmark brief, speaking with Professor O. Carter Sneed about his book, What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics, published by Harvard University Press, available through our religious catalog. What is this book about? The book is about uh, the law and public policy relating to bioethics, especially the vital conflicts of abortion and assisted reproduction, end-of-life decision-making, and makes the case that the best way to understand these issues and to critique the current state of the law is to view it through the lens of what I describe as anthropology, what the law's assumptions are about what it means to be and flourish as a human being. Because all law, at the end of the day, has to have such operating premises, because what law does and is for is to promote the protection of persons and to promote their flourishing. Thank you so much, Professor Carter Sneed. What it means to be human, the case for the body in public bioethics, available through our EW10 religious catalog. And I'm Doug Keck. Thanks for joining us here on this Bookmark Brief. We'll catch you next time. Want to be notified when EWTN Open Line goes live on Facebook? Follow EWTN Radio's Facebook page and click the bell icon to be notified. EWTN is everywhere. EWTN Radio programming is provided free of charge to over 500 domestic and international AM and FM radio stations. It's a great teaching tool for Catholics and non-Catholics alike. For a complete list of EWTN AM and FM stations across America, visit EWTNradio.net. At the bottom of the page, click Affiliates. EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. Tomorrow is your next chance to offer your urgent prayer requests. On Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. On most of these EWTN stations. Now back to Open Line with Father John Tregilio. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. One open phone line for you at 833-288-3986. Next up is Richard in upstate New York listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Richard, you are on with Father John Tregilio. Yeah, hi. I just want to uh, ask a question about the rosary especially when we try to share that with other people within the Latin Church, such as the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church or the New Anglican Anglican Church has been absorbed through that diocese in, in Houston. You know, how do we encourage them to embrace the rosary when historically that has not been a part of their charism and, and their liturgy? Okay, well, uh, first of all, from the... Um Eastern Catholic perspective, uh, they're distinct from we're Latin Rite or uh, Roman Rite uh, Catholics. They're Eastern Rite, but they're all part of the uh, Catholic Church. They're, they accept the jurisdiction of, of the Pope, the Roman Pontiff. Um, they have a different spirit. I mean, their spirituality is, is obviously the theology is the same. Their liturgy is, is uh, slightly different. Um, they don't have like Stations of the Cross, typically, as we do, they um, have icons, they don't have as many statues. Uh, they have other devotions which are valid and proper to their right. So I wouldn't want them to feel that, you know, we're, we're, that they have to, but most of the Byzantine Catholics and Eastern Catholics I know will do the rosary, but they also have other devotions. Uh, like during Lent, 
uh, instead of doing Stations of the Cross, they have the pre-sanctified liturgy, which is beautiful. Uh, the, the priest doesn't consecrate like he does at the normal divine liturgy. These, this is already consecrated Holy uh, Eucharist, um, but it's what we uh, used to call um, a dry mass. Uh, the, the priest says... Um, most of the prayers of the divine liturgy as if he was celebrating the full mass, but they use um, Holy Communion from uh, a previous divine liturgy. Uh, that's something that in the Eastern Church they go to faithfully. Um, that's something which obviously we want them to encourage to do. They're not forbidden to do Stage of the Cross, but they're not going to have it available, say, uh, in their church. Some of the um, Eastern Rite Catholic churches were Romanized uh, in the 1930s here in the United States. So they put in um, altar railings, they put in statues and things like that. But uh, after the council, uh, they were encouraged to go back to their uh, roots in that. So I would not want to force the rosary on on non-Latin rites, but in, uh, invite them, as you said, uh, and say, you know, here's one very viable um, uh, devotion. But I would encourage you as a Latin rite to go to the Eastern uh, Catholic Church for the pre-sanctified. It's a beautiful liturgy. You can go to their uh, masses on, on Sunday, if you like, and, and receive Holy Communion. Uh, in the, the Anglican ordinariate, I know a lot of high church Anglicans um, who even have not yet become part of the Catholic Church, they're familiar with and they they pray the rosary. Uh, it wasn't uh, part of their formal mandate. Uh, it's not in the Book of Common Prayer, uh, but again, invitation without making someone feel guilty is the way to go. Thank you. We appreciate that call today. Uh, Lulu is watching us on uh, YouTube, and she says that her parish has a large Spanish-speaking population, and a Spanish-speaking priest, at least in Lulu's estimation, needs to be added. And she wants to know how she could get one to her church, and is there a process? <laughs> Through the diocese, <laughs> um, especially because we they need to vet people. They make they have to make sure that these guys are not only validly and licitly ordained, but that they have all their credentials. Because we don't want these vagabonds, you know, priests who've had who've done bad things or questionable things. That's why every priest needs one of these letters of suitability. This has to go through the diocese. But you can suggest people. Um, a priest just doesn't show up and say, yeah, I speak Spanish, but you can find out who's interested, who's available, and then suggest to the diocese, you know, father or whoever's in that office, here's someone that may, maybe you could consider, all right? But it's not like you hire them on your own, okay? Uh, I, as a pastor, could bring in a priest to celebrate Mass uh, at my parish, as long as I follow all the, the procedures and that, uh, there's no problem. So you got to work with your local pastor and the local diocese as opposed to advertising, here's here's a position that's open. Although in the old days, you could do that. Now, because of all the things that's going on, you want to make sure he still has his faculties, he's um, you know properly vetted and all that. Karen is in the great state of Nebraska listening on Spirit Catholic Radio today. Karen, thanks for holding. Welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you. Um, Father, I just wanted to uh, ask, what would the process be to be confirmed if you have baptism and First Communion, but not confirmation yet, mid-20s? So thank you, Father. Okay. Uh, that's easily done. You speak to the local parish priest or deacon, and they arrange for um, instructions. Um, some, Depending on how much uh, catechesis the person needs, if... Uh, sometimes they'll ask them to participate in the RCIA program or, um, you know, with the other uh, people coming in. But I always found, you know, I, as a pastor, my personal preference was I met with them. I decided with them uh, on a case-to-case -case basis and said if this person really, you know, uh, since their first communion has no catechesis whatsoever, I would work with them either individually or give them the, the option if they want to go with the group. But typically, once a person's been baptized, it's up to the local bishop to confirm them. And only when the person was baptized outside the Catholic Church, say baptized as a Protestant Christian, that the priest or deacon could bring them in 
and confirm them at the Easter vi- I mean, the, only the priest could do that, I'm sorry, uh, confirm them at the Easter vigil. Um, but if they were baptized Catholic, he received Holy Communion and Confession as a Catholic, then the local bishop is the one to uh, confirm them, unless he delegates that to the to the uh, local pastor. But in, in most cases, the bishop has an annual or, or biannual uh, confirmation for the whole diocese. Um, gone are the days when I when I was confirmed. At the end, we had all the Catholic school kids got first. The public school kids in CCD got second, and then the adults were at the end of the line, and they kind of felt a little awkward with all these eighth graders in front of them. And that now we we sort of recognize that that's not necessarily the best way to go. So they would have a, a separate confirmation just for adults of the diocese. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Mary in the great state of Colorado watching us today on YouTube. Mary, you're on with Father John. Hello, Father John. I Hi. Have a ca- Hi. I have a Catholic friend who made a statement. She said that she always prays the Divine Mercy devotion for people who are dying. She said that she knows that one of the promises is that those souls will go to heaven. Well, I I don't want to keep her from praying, but I also (laughs) want to explain to her that that's not like a 100% guarantee, and it is up to God. How can I do that gently? Uh, Well, I think it's it's important that you do that. Uh, Maybe um, you could give her something to read uh, about that, um, get, get something online, but... Just in a very nice way, say I, I, it's a wonderful practice to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet for someone, or if you can get them, the person who's dying to, because that's easy to say, you know, for the sake of a sorrowful passion, uh, it, it's easy unless they're unconscious or it's difficult for them to speak. But you're absolutely correct. The praying of the Divine Mercy Chaplet is not a get out of jail free card that guarantees that they automatically go back to eat the indulgence. That's available with the apostolic part, and that's part of the um, anointing of the sick. That's contingent on the spiritual state of the person. They have to be completely detached from even venial sin. Uh, so that's not even uh, an, uh, an absolute. Uh, you hope and pray that it, that the person's properly disposed. So, I my dad he died on on feast of Our Lady of Lords back in 1998, and uh, he after we watched the mass on EWTN. We did the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and he passed away. And it was a it was a, a truly a happy death, as as uh, we would, as we asked Saint Joseph to to bless him with. But even there, okay, I still have masses celebrated. I say mass for my dad, because we're never we don't have metaphysical certitude, and uh, I would not want someone not to pray for the dead just because they did the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Does that help, Mary? That does help a lot. Thank you so much. Have Thank, a great day. Thanks. We appreciate the call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Louie driving to Virginia today, listening to us on Sirius XM Channel 130. Louie, you're on with Father John Tregilio. Uh, Hey, Father. Uh, um, so, um... Uh, uh, first, thanks for the uh, the book, the uh, Catholicism for um, uh, um, dummies. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I was gonna say idiots, but I knew it wasn't that. And then, um, uh, anyway, my question was: if I go to mass, I'm a, I'm I'm kind of bilingual, and I go to a mass, but I don't understand the, what the priest is saying in the homily. I can follow the rest of the mass easy enough, but if I don't understand his homily, is that mass still valid? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, because, thank goodness, because if that were the case, when I was a kid, we not only had priests from other countries that, that you couldn't understand, we had native-born English-speaking priests who you didn't understand. Either they mumbled or, or whatever. Uh, while it's optimum that you understand and hear the homily, what's absolutely essential and, and what's the, you know, the, the deal-breaker there, the priest has to say the words that are in the missal, especially the parts, this is my body, this is my blood. It must be over uh, grape wine and wheat bread and uh, with the intention to do what the church does, then it's a valid mass. Um, Even if you don't understand what he's saying, um, it's still a valid sacrament. But as a seminary uh, teacher here, we want the guys to, I, I say to them, when you're preaching, 
the people want to be able to understand what you're saying. So I say to the men, speak slow and clearly and with the proper volume. I said, you, you want them to appreciate the message you have to say. You can't use the same conversational tone that like we're doing right here on, on the radio. You need to have a, a preaching voice, so to speak. But yes, those were all valid masses, no question about it. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Next stop is Delaware. Richard is watching us on YouTube in Delaware. Richard, you're on with Father John. Uh, good, good afternoon, Father Triglio. My question is about the one saint they left this week, the seven founders of the Servites of Our Lady of Sorrows this Thursday in Florence, Italy. What do you know about them? Well, I have a great devotion to Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows because, one, I'm Italian, uh, Sicilian-Italian, to be precise. I have right on my on my desk here a statue of Our Lady of, of the Seven Sorrows with the seven swords in her, in her heart, and she's dressed in black, okay? Um, the Servites were, um, uh, the seven Servites particularly, uh, were a Florentine a group of, of religious men who uh, established this order, and they promote the devotion to Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows, the black scapular, which is distinct from the brown scapular. And the whole idea of the Seven Sorrows is to reflect on those instances in Mary's life where a sword of sorrow literally pierced her heart, as was prophesied by uh, St. Simeon uh, when they had the presentation of, of Jesus in the temple. So, for instance, the flight into Egypt was one of the sorrows. When Jesus was lost for three days, okay? When our Lord is, is crucified on the cross, when she takes his body, you know, in that beautiful image of the Pieta, her, the, her, the body of her dead son in her arms, when she has to bury him in, in the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, these are all instances where Our Lady, in a sense, had a sword pierced into her heart, not physically, but emotionally, and she survived only because of God's grace. And so if Our Lady could, could endure her seven sorrows, which were immense, you and I could go through the one or two that we get. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. You know, in South St. Louis County, Father, speaking of Lent yeah. and speaking of the, the seven holy founders, there's a seven holy, there's a seven holy founders parish in South St. Louis City, and buddy, I'm going to tell you what, you want to talk about a fish fry? Woo! Um, <laughs> I don't even like fishing, I'd wait in line there. Um, next up is Maureen in the great state of Colorado. She's listening on the Catholic Radio Network. Maureen, you're on with Father John. Uh, yes, Father John. I do have a quick question, because um, I do hear you refer to the... Um, you know, the Catholic Church, as I recognize it, the Latin, and then the Eastern, and I think it comes under another term called Byzantine, Benzedine, or I'm not pronouncing it correctly. But uh, when when was that distinction or that separation kind of, where did that begin? Okay. Um, yes, the Byzantine Catholic Church is a branch of the Eastern Catholic Church, um, sometimes people erroneously lump all the Eastern Catholics as Byzantine, and that's not uh, uh, precise. It, it's one part of the Eastern Catholic Church. There were these different patriarchates. Okay, you have the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. All right, you have Rome. Uh, we have uh, Antioch and Alexandria and Constantinople, and the Eastern tradition were the uh, those other patriarchs besides Rome. Uh, and that was considered the eastern part of the Eastern Roman Empire. Remember, they split the Roman Empire into two parts, east, the east and the west. And there was just one single Christian church, uh, and the Holy Father, the Bishop of Rome, uh, you know, was still the, the head of the church. In the 11th century is when Constantinople broke away and established the Eastern Orthodox Church, distinct from uh, the rest of the Catholic Church. And a lot of these eastern... Orthodox churches, um, I should say portions of them, returned to uh, to Rome uh, as part of the church um, around the 1600s. The only ones that never d departed were the Maronites. They were one that, that always stayed uh, part of the Catholic Church, always were 
under the jurisdiction of, of the of the Pope. So the Eastern Catholic Church, it's like what Pope John Paul the Great and Pope Benedict and Pope Francis referred to. It's one of the two lungs of the church. We have the East and the West. Both are valid. Both are um, considered Catholic. They have the seven sacraments. Uh, distinct from the Orthodox, which obviously has uh, valid sacraments, the Eastern Catholic Church is 100% part of the Catholic faith. They're under the Pope's jurisdiction, uh, and they are. We, we can receive communion in those. You can go to confession to any of those priests, and vice versa. It's just marriage laws that are and other little particulars. Um, but yes, Byzantine, which often is like when you think of the Ruthenians, Ukrainians, they're like the Eastern European branch. But there's also, like I said, you know, we have uh, in in um, Egypt and other parts of the world uh, these Eastern Catholic churches that are not Byzantine, but they're they're not uh, Orthodox. They're part of the Catholic Church with the capital C. If you'd like to be sure to uh, kick off your day with uh, the news of the day from a uniquely Catholic perspective, check out Catholic Connection with Teresa Tamio. You can hear it tomorrow morning and every morning, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern Time, right here on EWTN Radio. Next up is Robbie in San Diego watching us on YouTube today. Robbie, you're on with Father John. Hi, Father John. I used to watch you and the other priest. I can't remember his name. But I am from San Diego, California, and I am calling because I want to know if the sacrament of extreme unction, now known as anointing of the sick, is it as powerful as an exorcism? I had it done last week because I'm having a whole lot of problems, and I thought maybe it would help. Yes, the sacrament of the sick, um, anointing of the sick, which was formerly called extramunction, which, by the way, extramunction merely meant it was the last anointing, not that you were checking out per se, but that in the sequence, chronological sequence of the sacraments, you got your first anointing when you were baptized, you got another one when you were confirmed. If you were uh, ordained a, a priest, you got it then. So the anointing of the sick was the last one in that sequence, but doesn't mean that this was the last thing you got and then you, you checked out. Uh, obviously, some people, you know, they do pass away, and that's why we have the prayers uh, for preparation uh, uh, for death. This is a sacrament, so it's much more powerful than the sacramental. So the, the, the rite of exorcism, the prayer of exorcism, while very helpful, it cannot replace the actual sacrament, because uh, as we learned in theology, they work ex opere operato, so it affects what it's meant to do, whereas in a sacramental, ex, ex opere operantis, which depends on the spiritual state of the person th them, themselves. So having those prayers said are good, but it's much better to have the sacrament of the sick because it's a sacrament. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Next up is Dorothy in the great state of Michigan, listening also on Ave Maria Radio. Dorothy, thanks for holding. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father John, for taking my call. I have a question. Um, in, in, with, do, with all respect, I know the Catholic Church guards the baptism sacrament and well and, and administers it well, and that uh, I know recently I've heard that uh, people have been baptized with the wrong form, like, um, saying we baptize you instead of I baptize you. Uh, the question I have is, um, how is it then that the Catholic Church, if somebody wants to become Catholic and let's say go through the RCIA process and were baptized in a Protestant or church of some type that was Trinitarian, how is it that their their baptism would be valid because that uh, priest or uh, diocese wouldn't know the form necessarily that they were baptized in, you know, unless you know, except Trinitarian, but they wouldn't have known the words, I guess, is what my yes. question is. Well, um, that's a very good question. And I, as a pastor for 16 years, when I had someone who was uh, baptized, say, uh, Methodist or Presbyterian or any Protestant denomination at all, I would ask them not only for um, some kind of evidence that they were baptized, whether it's the actual certificate, uh, and we would take a photocopy of, of their original that they had, usually their mother had locked up in, in the attic somewhere. Uh, and in, in lieu of an actual copy of a document, uh, two affidavits of somebody who was actually physically present, 
And one of the questions we asked was, you know, was, was uh, water used? Was it p poured over the head or were they completely immersed where their head got wet? And was the Trinitarian formula uh, said? And if there's ever, ever, ever any doubt or question, then uh, the priest is to do a conditional baptism where I baptize you if you are not baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, it was in recent vintage that some of the non-Catholic Christian churches were changing the formula. Um, you know, some of them were just, you know, um, dunking them up into their neck. Um, but up to the up until that time, most of the Protestant churches were doing complete immersion. Uh, they were using the Trinitarian formula. This is more of recent vintage, and I would, for me, recent, recent means since the 1970s, um, that you had people uh, altering uh, the actual formula. So the priest or the deacon who's in the pro, who's running the RCIA program has to do their research. The person can't just say, oh, yeah, I was baptized. Say, so, well, we need to see some um, documentation on that. Not that we don't believe them. But we need to do a little research. And the United States Conference of Catholic Bishop, uh, Bishops issued a, a particular edict uh, back in the 1980s that said they researched it, and these particular denominations, for the most part, have valid baptism, and they're the mainline churches, you know, the Episcopalian, the Lutheran, the um, <clears throat> Methodist. But that doesn't mean that there might not be exceptions, and some of these independent churches you know, there might be a difference. I know for sure that um, Pope, uh, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, issued a statement uh, from the Vatican that uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, their baptism was declared uh, invalid from a Catholic standpoint. Uh, that's the only time I remember an explicit uh, judgment was made. Uh, in those cases, someone would need to be baptized. But uh, if there's any question, it's conditional. But if you have corroborated evidence... You know, then because you're, you're forbidden to rebaptize anybody. And very quickly, we'll head to Susan in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Sorry, Susan, but just about a minute left with Father John. What's your question? Father, um, my question has to do with homosexual marriages. Um, my, my niece is getting so called married to her uh, girlfriend, and I'm getting a lot of pressure from the family to attend it, and I refuse to go. I mean, what's the church's guidance on this yeah we don't want to give credence or support to something that's invalid and uh as wrong but at the same token you want to you know treat this with charity and, and and compassion so yes don't go but explain to them why you're not going say you know i love you i'm going to pray for you i'm not rejecting your your your, your friend there i'm rejecting you know this uh relationship uh that is not countenanced by by my conscience or my faith uh, so you could do that in, in a compassionate way. It needs to be said, either in writing or, or um, verbally. But yes, you know, you, if you go and act as if this was a normal thing and go to the reception, you go to the, um, you know, uh, bachelorette party or whatever, or, you know, <laughs> stack party, I don't know what they're going to do. But if you treat it in the same way as, as a normal value, even with, you know, invalid marriages where you've got a man and a man marrying a woman, but it's invalid because they've been married once or twice before. They're not getting married in church. I wouldn't go to that one either. Father, the time flies by. Would you please leave us with a blessing? Benedica vos omnipotens Deus, Pater, et Filius, et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father John Tregilio, our producer, Michael McCall, our call screener and social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson, I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line Monday. Just getting another week started. Father Wade Menezes in the house tomorrow. Father Mitch will be with us on Wednesday. Thursday, Dominican Father Brian Malady, And our very own Vice President of Theology will close out the week, Colin Donovan, on Friday. Until we get together tomorrow with Father Wade, God bless. Tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Morning Show. We'll celebrate the feast of St. Claude de la Colombière, Apostle of the Sacred